our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, starting with Sam Asasava. Um, Sam is the director of the California Office of Planning and Research. Uh, Leah Fisher, um, who is the um, program director for Invest in Our Future, and Leah was a co-author with me uh, for the Southwest region for the National Climate Assessment, and Brittany Moffitt, who is a uh, um, senior resilience engineer with ERA. Um, so we're looking forward to a wonderful discussion, and I'm just going to sort of set the stage and talk about um, the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Uh, so the U.S. National Climate Assessment is mandated by the U.S. Global Research Change Act of 1990. Uh, the act mandates that the assessment be produced approximately every four years. Uh, just on November 14th of this year, the fifth U.S. National Climate Assessment was released. I was honored to be with the president, uh, the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the director of the National Climate Assessment, Allison Crimmins, at the White House on uh, November 14th for the release. And it, I must say it was quite a different experience than having participated um, in the fourth National Climate Assessment when the report was released on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, with no um, fanfare, no recognition by the White House, and no other uh, follow-up action. So it was really rewarding. Um, the current administration has made it a priority uh, to foreground science and to foreground science and science advice um, as part of their approach to um, uh, climate change. Now, uh, the, the National Climate Assessment is produced by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and USGCRP itself is a coalition of 14 federal agencies. Uh, and the, the USGCRP and then the Office of the U.S. National Climate Assessment brings together over 700 contributors to create the assessment. So there were more than 500 contributors to the assessment in the, term, in the form of authors, co-authors, coordinating lead authors, um, uh, agency coordinating lead authors, technical contributors, et cetera. And there were another 200 plus um, participants who were um, part of the technical support units, part of OSTP, uh, part of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. So the report itself is really the culmination of almost four years of work, two and a half years of dedicated work with the team of more than 700 people uh, contributing to that, to that effort. And what's important, I think, about the assessment, so uh, thinking about um, Greg Jacobs and his amazing film that we saw yesterday, you know, one of the critical sort of conclusions of the assessment is that climate change is here now. Right? Climate change is affecting Americans, affecting Americans in every state in the United States and in every community. Uh, as we heard in the discussion last night, climate change is affecting every state and community across the 10 across region. Um, but also a critical um, conclusion of the report is that America is responding to climate change and Americans are taking action on climate change. Um, actions to, uh, I won't, I'll say the word mitigate, but after Allison's communications seminar yesterday, for those who were able to uh, attend the climate communications workshop, I'll say Americans are taking actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Um, Americans are taking actions uh, to adapt to, to climate change, and we're going to talk about some of those um, actions today. And so, the final point I'll make about the assessment is that it is the authoritative, consensus-based summary of climate change risks, impacts, and actions for the United States. Uh, the assessment went through um, seven different drafts. There were five different reviews of the assessment, including three public reviews, and including a review by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, it is a common set of facts. It's really important in our current um, political landscape that when we're talking about decision making around policy and community planning and actions that we can take, that we start from a base of a common understanding of the issues and a common understanding of the facts. Um, and so that's what's really important about the NCA is we now have this common understanding of the facts. We have awareness Many Americans are experiencing climate change, particularly through extreme events, 
like extreme heat, floods, other, um, other extreme weather events. They're experiencing that and we have the once in a generation investment to be able to address these changes. So through the bipartisan infrastructure law, IIJA, the, um, the infrastructure law, we have more federal funding to states, communities, and we have phil uh, philanthropists, um, foundations, and private sector enterprises all stepping up to take action. So while we have some challenges ahead of us, we also have an opportunity or a moment to respond to those challenges. So that's sort of how we'll set the stage. I'm gonna turn now to um, Leah Fisher to kick us off. So I had the privilege of leading an amazing diverse group of individuals to help write the assessment for the Southwestern United States, which notably for Ten Across includes California and Arizona. Um, Leah, can you just tell us from your perspective what you saw as some of the key findings from the Southwest chapter of the United States and particularly perhaps those that might be most relevant to folks here uh, in this room? Yeah, thanks Dave. Um, I just want to echo what Dave said. It was, despite being a lot of work and a lot of people, it was so much fun to work on this chapter. So if anyone ever gets the chance, I uh, highly recommend it. Um, so in our chapter, uh, just like Dave said, for the entire assessment, uh, current and projected climate risks are laid out for um, the region's water resources, ocean and coast, food and fiber, health and demographics, and wildfire. Um, as an author team, we also wove in considerations of equity and justice, indigenous knowledge, ecosystem impacts, and economic impacts into all of those key messages. So I think you'll see that reflected in our chapter. Um, broadly speaking, and again to echo what Dave said, over the past five years, I think everyone in the room knows climate change in the Southwest has become increasingly apparent. We're all experiencing different impacts. At the same time, um, our understanding and ability to model the impacts on different sectors and processes has improved, which allows in turn for governments and different groups to do more robust adaptation planning. Um, I'm gonna hit really briefly on water, sea level rise, and heat, uh, just to give some highlights, but there's obviously a lot more I can't touch on today. Um, for water, uh, the impacts themselves, you know, we are seeing reduced surface water and groundwater availability um, in the Southwest, and there are inequities in how these impacts are experienced, especially for indigenous communities. Um, so while the future around water can be tough, uh, what was exciting for me to see in the chapter uh, is the summary of adaptive water governance and management approaches that are already being implemented, so the actions being taken. Um, in California, we have the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, so to uplift that as an example, and there's a lot of collaborative and cross-sectoral work going on in the Colorado River Basin. Um, sea level rise, so the impacts include flooding, of course, but also saltwater intrusion into our groundwater, which is a pretty scary one for me. Um, we know this will have severe and disproportionate impacts on infrastructure and communities, and the chapter specifically highlights uh, impacts of more frequent flooding that's expected for affordable housing in California, as well as for frontline communities living near toxic sites. Um, and just to give a stat, there was a project here in California that found 440 hazardous sites, so this includes power plants, refineries, uh, hazardous waste sites, are projected to be at risk for at least one flood event per year by 2100. So you know water in hazardous site will impact the people living around these, these sites. Um, and then heat, uh, there are projected increases in childhood asthma and impacts um, for outdoor workers, or sorry, to the health of outdoor workers. The chapter highlights limited health and safety standards for farm workers um, and other outdoor workers is a key concern. And so to move into adaptation, which I, what Dave said of laying out this foundational knowledge base, what was so exciting for me to see in NCA5 in the fifth one is that yes, we have a base on the impacts themselves, but also on all the actions being taken. And we can speak authorita authoritatively um, about the leadership in this region. Uh, quickly for heat, um, the Arizona Department of Health Services has created a new heat policy guidance which has already resulted in recommendations for school heat safety um, and adaptation strategies for school children. And then for California um, to uplift sea level rise, adaptation planning for sea level rise has advanced both at the state level down to local governments. Um, for the state, and I'd say I might touch on this, but government is applying climate science into decision making for the state agencies. This has become a mandate and a requirement. And then I really wanted to end by uplifting the local leadership in California that I think can be a model for other, other areas and other topics. Um, 
at the time of drafting the chapter, which I've lost track of time, but was probably over a year ago, uh, 19 coastal counties in this, or sorry, of 19 coastal counties, 18 had either completed a vulnerability assessment, developed an adaptation policy, or updated their general plan to include climate adaptation. So there's a lot of leadership, and these are only uh, what, two examples that I could give. Um, the chapter highlights a lot of leadership in this region, but obviously there's a lot more work to do. A couple points to amplify there. Um, first of all, I also want to recognize uh, Elizabeth Kobley, who was one of our uh, co-authors on the chapter. I think Elizabeth is over here, um, who really led much of the work around uh, the climate impacts on water resources, as well as the adaptive governance responses to those um, to those uh, risks. Uh, and also point out, um, I believe Dave Handula is here. Dave, uh, back in the other corner, uh, the leader for the City of Phoenix uh, Office of Heat Response and Mitigation, um, and his team and the researchers and others supporting Dave and his team uh, are the ones who have been um, you know, responsible in helping to develop these uh, heat mitigation and heat readiness programs uh, uh, in the, the city of Phoenix, which I think are a great example of adaptation strategies to the risks that, that we face. Um, and before we move on, I, I, I neglected to give Leah, um, and I'll ask each of you just to give a, a minute or two of, of more extended introduction. Just tell me a little bit more about, um, you know, invest in our future. I know this is a relatively new position for you after spending you know, some time working both in state and federal government, and, and now you're in the philanthropic sector. So just tell us a little bit about invest in our future and your role there. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, I worked for both t two federal agencies and then for the state of California for over a decade, so I'm still working on my elevator pitch intro for Invest in Our Future. But um, we are a, a new philanthropy, a pooled fund that was created after IRA passed the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to help philanthropy climate funders mobilize to help make sure these investments are successful on the implementation side. So it's been really fun. They, they hired me and a few other people, we're, we're very small right now, um, with experience in government specifically and in doing this work and how to get money down on the ground to community groups and tribes uh, to help philanthropy move in that direction. So um, it's been a lot of fun and uh, the focus is more on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also on just broadly speaking, providing extra funding so groups can get technical assistance and capacity to actually go after this federal money. Um, and personally, I'm excited to, to help break some silos uh, in, in philanthropy that exist between, um, I'd say, reducing emissions and adaptation. Um, let's turn to um, Sam next for just, again, a quick introduction. Just tell us about yourself. Tell us a little bit about the office that you lead um, as part of Governor Newsom's leadership team. Um, and then we'll you know, move on to, to Brittany and then get into some more questions. Thanks. Is this working? Uh, thanks, Dave. First of all, congratulations for this incredible document. It is, I've looked at it, I've skimmed through it, and had my staff actually summarize it. So I think probably the best of the last uh, four or five uh, documents. Uh, and thanks to 10X as well for inviting me. Uh, I uh, joined the state of California two years ago when the governor appointed me as a director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, OPR, which was created in 1970 by Governor Reagan at that time, two years after CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, was uh, became law. So the office was created to uh, manage CEQA, develop guidelines, but also coordinate statewide uh, state agencies around climate um, impacts, uh, as well as the state's uh, uh, comprehensive land use um, agency. Uh, when I joined two years, this was the first time in its history, actually, the state appointed someone with a land use background to be the uh, director of that, that office. Since I joined, the office has grown significantly and primarily because of a lot of the climate invest investments and community investments that the state has been putting into, um, into its programs and policies. So my office has a, a number of uh, functions, including climate. Uh, we'll talk about the FIFS assessment. It's charged with developing California's uh, fifth climate assessments and a number of uh, climate um, technical assistance and grant uh, grant programs. Um, fantastic, thank you. And you know, point out you mentioned that Governor Reagan had 
led to the creation of your office. Point out also, um, relative to the conversation we had uh, last night about the political dynamics, dynamics in our country, just point out it was uh, President Bush Sr., uh, pr President George H.W. Bush, who signed the Global Change Research Act of 1990, creating the process that led to the National Climate Assessment. Um, Brittany, senior resilience engineer, love that title. What does a senior resilience engineer do? Um, and you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited to be here and grateful to be with this this particular group. Um, so I sit in the space of, of taking climate science and climate science insights into strategizing and implementing projects that get at reducing emissions and adapting to an escalating environment, right? So as a I'm a senior resilience engineer with Arup. Arup is a collection of about 17,000 engineers, uh, designers, urban planners, scientists across the globe tackling different complex projects and problems in the built environment from uh, approaching stormwater management with nature-based solutions uh, to building bridges that'll last generations to where a lot of my work sits, looking at building decarbonization in the context of climate hazards and other crises like the affordable housing crisis, right? Um, so. I, I look at this report and I'm very impressed because you guys have done a beautiful job of putting a bow around really critical and complex topics. And, and to give you maybe a little bit more context of, of what I find really useful in my space is um, there's like three types of graphs and figures that as I comb through I like immediately shared with colleagues. And, and that was like the first were around um, articulating what an unprecedented time we are in now, like let alone the future, right now. And, and some of the, the statements that were said around that um, or facts that were provided was the, you can correct me if I get it wrong, but that um, in the 80s we had billion dollar disasters every four months and, and now we're seeing this at a rate of every three weeks. Like unprecedented, is kind of like a clinical term, it's like a little procedural, but I would argue is one of the most terrifying words of the English language, because in this conversation, we're talking about a future we can't readily picture. Like our, our memories does not, do not serve us to pave the path of seeing what, what comes next. And that translates to a built environment, a social infrastructure, and, and, and e natural ecosystems that are unprepared for the realities that we are already reckoning with. Uh, this, the second was the articulation around how unequal those impacts are. And uh, there's a, uh, one graph in particular that's looking at, at um, land surface temperature against medium income in a, a couple of metropolitan areas that just like really beautifully hits home the point that the vulnerabilities that we see now is not just like, ooh, a natural unfolding of things, right? Like these are consequences of racist policies and historic disinvestment in communities of color um, and in indigenous populations. And, and we are seeing those show up as vulnerabilities now that need to be uh, explicitly, thoughtfully, and actively addressed. Uh, and, and third was the framing around transformational adaptation, right? I, and I think that's where we see a lot of our work and that we're kind of doggedly committed to is connecting uh, adaptation, mitigation, and equity, right? That, that if you are not pursuing all of these things holistically and synergistically, um, you're going to cause harm, right? So on, on one side of the coin is a lot of caution and on the other side is this extreme and rare opportunity to make some really, uh, you know, unprecedented in a good way impacts. Um, so I, I think this could have been like a really bummer report to be honest, but, but because it, uh, of, of that, that inspiration, that framing that you guys have baked in, um, I, I like uh, so much of it resonated and I see it as incredibly valuable as part of the conversation that we are having really at all scales. That um, a couple of things to amplify before we move on. Uh, one is that the report this year, the, the website is the report of record, um, and it's an incredibly dynamic website. Uh, just in our chapter alone, in the Southwest chapter that Leah and I and Elizabeth and others wrote, we have, I know this because in the final copy editing stage, I had to actually check every single one of these. We have 300 cross references in our chapter to other chapters within the report. So as you read 
you know, it, it's actually a very dynamic experience to read the report because you're reading about the Southwest and then it, you pick up on an issue having to do with, let's say, overburdened um, uh, communities. And Leah mentioned this uh, pressure on particularly outdoor workers. And our section talks about the reduction in what's called physical work capacity, the ability of people to work outdoors. So think agricultural farm workers, folks in the construction industry, et cetera. Um, based on research that we report on in the chapter, uh, by mid-century, under different climate scenarios, we could see a reduction of up to 25% in the physical work capacity of outdoor workers. So that means a potential 25% loss of the labor capacity in the agricultural sector. Think about that impact on Arizona, California, across the, the Ten Across region. Um, and so you can really sort of just weave your way through the interconnection of the different issues. And also point out, um, as, as Brittany notes, the graphics in this report are remarkable. We spent a lot of time focusing on the graphics, using those best principles of science communication that, that Brittany talked about yesterday. Um, and, and one of the serendipitous moments was after the report was released, uh, one of our um, colleagues posted on social media a rundown of different graphics from the National Climate Assessment and the color schemes alongside outfits from Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey uh, to show the, the comparison between NCA5 graphics and Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. And just that one social media post drove so much of the engagement um, and links over to the report. So once again, reaffirming, uh, I talked to Allison, the director, saying, you know, can we got to get this to Taylor's people? Can we get Taylor Swift to retweet the National uh, Climate Assessment uh, report? So we're still working on that. Um, we saw what she did with one post about uh, uh, vote.org uh, link. She drove like 50,000 registrations in a couple hours by posting uh, an encouragement to vote. Um, Sam, I'm going to turn to you. One of the things that the National Climate Assessment does is it documents, um, you know, through the peer-reviewed literature, the different adaptation and mitigation efforts that, un that are underway and recognizes those efforts. And so the state of California has been a national leader in this space. Um, California is a member of the U.S. Climate Alliance, uh, committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris Climate Accord. Um, has put in forth and put in place plans to complete that process, but really more importantly, it's actually put into place funding to um, complete the programs. And that climate financing is such a critical missing piece of what we're trying to accomplish with transformative climate adaptation. So Sam, can you just talk a little bit about the specific policies and actions that are be ta being taken in California and how those are being um, supported with investment from the state and the federal level and philanthropy and private sector as well? Sure. I, I think you touched on it earlier around the unprecedented investments in federal dollars that we're getting uh, uh, this opportunity that we have. I think California uh, really has outdone itself just in the last few years around commitments to climate change. So the $48 billion uh, budget last year was a record for any state in the country. But that's not the only investment. The incredibly unprecedented time in terms of alignment between the legislature and the governor actually points to significant billions of dollars more investments in various agencies over the last four or five years, very specifically targeting adaptation um, uh, strategies, grant programs to actually empower communities at the ground level so that they uh, can actually uh, chart their path in terms of climate adaptation and resiliency, uh, as well as very robust um, uh, clear plans, the California Resource Board's uh, scoping plan in the 2022 uh, really outlines both strategy and actions, how we get to 85% um, you know, reduction from 1990 level by 2045, and uh, charges every single agency within the state uh, uh, organization to take their role with science-based uh, data and information to make impacts at a whole of government uh, level. This is something that the governor has been preaching um, uh, since he came to office, uh, but we're operationalizing it that uh, my office, for example, in addition to working with the, um, uh, the FIPS assessment, 
uh, coordinates with the California Natural Resources, uh, uh, CARB, uh, the Strategic Growth Council, and a number of climate-related technical assistance that we provide at the ground level. Uh, we target a lot of our resources, for example, the Strategic Growth Council. This is a state agency which I chair uh, that has about seven state agency secretaries that make up the council. So we use greenhouse gas funds to support any kind of action around technical assistance, uh, affordable housing and sustainable communities is probably one of the most successful one, uh, where we target our resources to impact, have multiple impacts, climate being a central part of it. AHSC, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, last uh, few months ago, we awarded $757 million for 21 uh, housing development projects that are 100% electric uh, and, and address uh, greenhouse gas reduction. That is a record that we broke from the year before. So what I'm pointing to is there is a concerted, uh, uh, coordinated effort within state government that is unprecedented as well in terms of recognizing the uh, existential threat that we have today, not tomorrow. Um, and uh, from where I sit, there has never been, and there will never be in our lifetime, such an incredible opportunity when you add the federal dollars and the $180 billion that is coming to California and more around infrastructure. So what we're trying to do within, uh, within our programs is how do we connect the dots that everything is interrelated. Our housing policy is interrelated with climate and equity policy. Our infrastructure policy is about climate and, and, and equity. Uh, our response to climate is, uh, uh, has to be you know, uh, buttressed not just by infrastructure that we build or uh, mitigate urban heat island, but the community infrastructure that we need to create so that the people on the ground are uh, informed and uh, are uh, responsive and resilient to, to what, is, what is here today. Thanks, Sam. Um, that allows me actually to um, bring uh, Brittany into the conversation next because um, you talked about a couple mm -hmm. things, you know, the greenhouse gas reductions, um, decarbonization is an important part of this process. You know, the National Climate Assessment is a policy influential but policy neutral report. It doesn't prescribe policy, but it helps to frame and provide information. Um, Brittany, in your work, I know you're working on decarbonization, particularly in the building sector. Um, but your work ties decarbonization to other issues, right? So um, just talk a little bit about decarbonization in the building sector and how that relates um, perhaps not intuitively to affordable housing, you know, as one example, um, and how does decarbonization report to, or um, in that sector relate to things like preventive health care and, and supporting these other beneficial outcomes that we're seeking through climate action? Yeah, absolutely. So. I, I think about this a lot, coming from the perspective of, of looking over my partner's shoulders. Uh, my, my partner is an emergency doctor here in Los Angeles, and so I, I hear about her experiences day to day, uh, horrified. Uh, and sometimes that's because there's stories that involve maggots that I didn't need to hear. But often it's because you're seeing these, these our, our medical system just so overstretched. Like she'll go a 13 hour shift and see one patient in a, in a room. And that, that is not because there's a lack of patients, it's because she's seeing them in hallways. She did a hand procedure in a hallway the other day. She's seeing them in corners of the waiting room. Like the, the level of, of, or the rate that that revolving door swings is so extreme, right? And, and it's at a time when we're not in the heat of COVID, right? COVID exists, we're not in the early stages. We're not in the middle of a heat wave. We're not immediately post an earthquake. So what happens when we are? Like you can readily picture how many folks fall through the cracks. And if you, if you start to you know, take a look at who's coming through those emergency department doors, um, it, it's, it's not just the folks who have uh, a, a, a medical emergency um, just by virtue of bad luck, it's a lot of folks who the built environment has failed, right? Whether they don't have access to it because they aren't housed and they're looking for a place to sleep that night, um, whether, you know, it's 
uh, the gentleman who's coming in with 106 degree fever because of heat stress or, or an elderly person who's fallen down the stairs because of the power outage. Um, there's, there's such an influx of folks uh, coming through those doors uh, and, and I think of that emergency department as the last line of defense because it's accessible regardless of immigration status, regardless of income level, regardless of housing. Um, and if that's the last line of defense, the built environment is the first. And there's so many synergies that like thankfully exist with, with building decarbonization and preparing for a more extreme climate. And, and that looks like things like weatherization, like increasing passive survivability. So when, when the power goes out, more readily that building can, can provide for a safe indoor environment. It's, it's leaning into distributed energy resources, so looking at solar PV, looking at battery storage, uh, and, and making, whether you're talking on individual building scale or community scale, these, these islandable microgrids, right? It, it's, it's providing safety and access to things, like electricity is increasingly becoming a necessity. Um, so I, I see, like, I, I, it's, it's so important that we are looking for opportunities to intersect building decarbonization with other critical needs. And, and again, like I feel very grateful that those, those links readily exist. So how do we take this moment of funding and make it count in seven different directions, right? How do we look at building decarbonization and the preservation of affordable housing as like, oh, fundamentally twin goals. It, I think it's such an important point you make, and it, it reinforces the notion that climate action um, leads to a more resilient and more just and equitable future, and it provides co-benefits in so many other areas of people's lives. So, right, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the climate workshop, the communications workshop, right, talking about the benefits of climate action um, to everyday people and their lives, to the economy, to their employment, to their health. It's such a winning message to try to mobilize support. I'm gonna give fair warning that we'd love to have some audience questions. Um, so begin to think, we're not quite there yet, but I'm gonna give you a warning to think about those questions. We've already got some ready in the, in the chamber. Um, so think about some questions. I wanna come to, to Leah next. Um, Brittany's given us a great example of connecting um, climate action related to physical infrastructure and how that helps lead to, to co-benefits. Um, what about uh, the sort of community or social or institutional infrastructure that goes along with that? Um, so uh, just talk about perhaps some of the work that you hope to do with, um, you know, invest in our future, how we might use things like community resilience hubs or other institutional or social infrastructure uh, to support the types of climate actions that, that are um, implied by the, the scientific understanding of climate risks. Is this working? Yes. Uh, I, well, that's something I'm super passionate about, and I, I think um, I'll answer the question, and then I have a point to make about California and then the other states in the region. But um, at the Strategic Growth Council, which Sam mentioned, and I uh, had the honor to work there for a few years, uh, they've built um, programs to do exactly what Dave said. You know, how do you get money out, not to immediately deliver maybe you know, new infrastructure, but to provide the human infrastructure for these communities that have, because of government decisions, both federal and, and state decisions, been left without resources, without capacity to plan their own futures. Um, so uh, there are programs doing this in California, and I think for philanthropy, what we're seeing, and this is tying nicely into the, the point I wanted to make, um, California is a huge economy, and therefore our state government, I still say R as if I work there, but the, and I live here, but the state government has a lot of money and a, and a lot of resources that I know many of these states in, on the 10 across side, you know, the state government is not acting the way California is, but that doesn't mean all hope is lost. Um, the federal government, when they launched Justice 40 and some of these new programs you're seeing, modeled a lot of it after state programs and came and talked to my old colleagues and I think that that shows, you know, they're learning from what's already out there, and there's an opportunity now for the whole country to benefit. But federal government also has limited resources. So philanthropy, you know, we're trying to come in and be additive now. So how can we provide funding for staff capacity so that groups, whether that's, you know, capacity to state governments, local governments, tribes, community groups, so there's actually people <laughs> to go write the grants, find the consultants to work with, you know, the things that take take time and money. So 
um, I don't think will be successful without dedicated attention to this and especially being willing to invest in places that may not be ready to go build their, their microgrid, but they know they, they want to pursue resilience, they want to reduce energy burden um, on homeowners, on residents, on renters, and if you provide the capacity for them to get together and do that planning, it will lead to projects, and we're, we're seeing that not just in, in California. Um, so I'll give one quick example in Houston. Uh, there's a program um, that we're really, I think, lucky to fund that's working with residents in Northeast Houston to turn their homes into resilience hubs at the homeowner level. And this came from the community. They wanted this when these hurricanes are hitting and they literally can't evacuate and they're surrounded by water. So each individual home is becoming a hub for their neighbors and a place for people to go and, and just be together and be resilient and wait out, wait out the disaster when they have nowhere else to go. Yeah, and of course that builds that social cohesion, right, and, it, and, and potentially addresses some of the challenges that we heard about yesterday, um, you know, in the opening session about the political polarization in our country, right, when you're helping neighbors, helping neighbors, right, that, it's such an important part. Um, uh, Sam, you seem like you have a follow-up, and I want to ask you then uh, to also uh, address this question, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, the United Nations has called this the decade of action on the sustainable development goals. Uh, you know, we also have this window of opportunity we've talked about in terms of increased public awareness, funding. Um, you know, we're trying to reach a number of critical goals in the next, I mean, the, the next 18 months are probably going to be the most 18, important 18 months in the United States in terms of climate action. Um, so what do we do, you know, how do we take advantage of this moment uh, in California, across the 10 across region, um, you know, in the U.S., how do we make this next 18 months uh, matter uh, for the next several decades? So there are two things, and it will continue to sort of add to what Leah was saying, which is one of the critical part of it is communicating. So fantastic document, a, a great graphics. Uh, that is not enough, especially for the people who need to understand and, and, and be engaged in. Uh, most of us in this profession will read it, will be excited about it. It is a fantastic document, but it needs to reach to you know, the blue states and red states and everything in between. And how do you do that? So that community infrastructure is one of the foundational things that we need to invest in, even in the next 18 months, next uh, 10 years. Uh, our office, uh, the governor created the Office of Community Partnership and Strategic Communications in my office last, a year and a half ago, for this very specific reason of how we engage local community-based organizations around extreme heat, uh, save our water campaign, any kind of key disaster issues or climate-related issues. The most impacted communities are uh, black and brown. Uh, their geographic areas are pretty determined. And a lot of the CBOs who work on the ground are the people who know what the solutions ought to be. So this office is working with 120 community-based organizations that can communicate in 40 different languages throughout the state so that we get the message out. So when we get information from the national assessment or our own assessment or the science and the data, we want to put it in a language that an 80-year-old and an 80-year-old can understand it. Until we do that, until we communicate and people understand it, whether they're blue or red, I, I don't think we can address uh, uh, the issue uh, in, a, in a most in impactful way. And then the second part of what we need to do is, I think it's time to stop planning and do, uh, action. Action is the most important thing now. We just don't have time. And we're not going to have an opportunity like this. So over the next 10 years, uh, whether it's on the infrastructure bill or uh, you know the built infrastructure or the community community infrastructure, we really have to think about how do we get that on the ground? How do we implement that? And that takes partnerships from the private sector, public sector, and community-based organizations. So that's, I think, the urgency.